on this edition of Native Report. We see how an organic recycling facility benefits communities that use it. Again, that whole interaction between Indian people and what they want for their children. We meet Rosemary Christensen, a founding member of the National Indian Education Association. And we continue with part five of the documentary, Inalik Little Diomede, about an island in the Bering Strait. We also learn something new about Indian country and hear from our elders on this Native Report. Production of Native Report is made possible by grants from the Shakopee Medwakanton Sioux Community, the Mille Lacs Band of Ojibwe, and the Blandin Foundation. Welcome to Native Report, I'm Stacy Thunder. The concept of recycling is a simple one, to treat or process used or waste materials and make them suitable for reuse. But there is much more to that, as we shall see at the organic recycling facility owned and operated by the Shakopee Benwakanton Sioux community. Owned and operated by the Shakopee Minwakaten Sioux community, the Organics Recycling Facility opened to the public in 2011. We have a 25 acre fence facility on approximately 47 acres of trust property. Um, and we're turning this into a soil amendment facility for compost uh, available for retail sale. In keeping with Dakota tradition and Indian values, um, to take care of Mother Earth, uh, re recycling and the way you, you treat Mother Earth, uh, that's all part of it. To give um, a chance to put some of our waste together and con contain our waste and then put, turn it around and use it um, in, a, in, a, in a positive manner. In, in old tribal tradition, none of the uh, no material was, was wasted in, in sacrificing for trees or, or in a buffalo hunt. Um, every part of the animal was used. Um, you try to maintain that type of thinking when you do something like this. Um, it, there's a, a huge capital uh, output, but there's also got to be some return as well, and, and part of that has to do with making this as efficient as possible. Local city governments and school districts may use the facility at no cost, while area vendors and commercial haulers pay a fee. Except for the five major holidays, it is open five days a week throughout the year. The Prior Lake and Savage Schools have added recycling efforts in a partnership with a lot of the uh, local governments and community. We accept a lot of the waste products, a lot of the recycling um, for free. And in coinciding with our philosophy of reaching out to the local governments and helping to provide a service that can add to and enhance perhaps the area. A lot of our customers include residential, commercial, industrial, and agricultural uh, throughout the community. Composting is, is breaking down organic matter, um, complex organic matter into a simpler form so it can be used as a soil amendment. What exactly is going on here? Um, out here, well, we've got all the raw products for the compost are lined up out here. The uh, yard waste and the hay bales are, are carbon. Basically, they're the same as wood fiber, it's cellulose. Then we've got organic material. There's grass, um, food waste, um, some other kinds of green organic material. You mix those up and they break down in the presence of oxygen to make compost. So you have to mix a nice recipe and that's what they're doing. They're hauling it all down, running it through that grinder, and then they'll mix it into these windrows that you see right behind us here. They start on that end with the raw windrows, and as they get finished, we move them with a lateral conveyor in this direction. When they get down here, they're finished, and then we screen them, 
The coarse stuff goes back in the system. The fine stuff goes out for sale. The, the raw material, one, once we, we try to get it from these stockpiles into the windrows within a couple of weeks after receiving it, because it will start to compost in that pile. And then once it's in the windrow, it's about a 12-week process until it's finished. And when it's finished, it has very low mineral content, very high organics. It's a very organic rich material, uh, great for gardens. We get cucumbers that weren't quite good enough to make get any pickles with, they come here. Um, we get some waste from, through, through a, a vendor from Walmart and from Chipotle. And that's all source separated food organics. It gets mixed with this brown stuff and turned into compost. Keeps it out of the landfill. Um, reduces greenhouse gases, saves money for the vendor and for the, makes money for the tribe. So it's kind of a win-win all the way around. The organic material is used in Wazupi, SMSC's own community garden. But there are other uses for it as well. This is all part of the overall philosophy reflecting cultural values. We've developed an organic farm um, in the Dakota word for that would be Wazupi and that farm produces an organic food. In order to maintain that, it needs to use the, the compost that's made from a general raw organic material. Um, we have an extensive landscaping um, program around our community, and we are able to not only use our waste materials and bring them down here, but we're also able to use it in a lot of those projects. Right now, we're also using a approximately 144 solar panels um, and that provides, uh, generates electricity not only for here but we're able to provide more electricity onto the grid. The future possible developments are, are bagging and branding our own product um, for retail sale for, for compost. Um, we also have this facility in conjunction with a wood drying uh, process that we're making available to Coda Energy in partnership with Roar Malting here in Shakopee that produces a green energy that wood processing, uh, drying and, and mulching the wood for fuel to generate a turbine that will produce a, a green energy. So it all fits in with, you know, tradition, value, Mother Earth. Did you know that some federal environmental laws allow Indian tribal governments to be treated as states? Because of tribal concerns for the environment, and because states do not have civil regulatory authority over Indian land, Congress made provisions in a number of environmental laws for tribes to take primacy over their lands and protect them from environmental harm. In particular, the Clean Water Act, the Safe Drinking Water Act, and the Clean Air Act all have provisions that treat tribes as states. Under these laws, federally recognized tribal governments may petition the Environmental Protection Agency to assume responsibilities. Under the Clean Air Act, the law provides for federal resolution of disputes between tribal governments and states. Either government may request the EPA to enter into negotiations and to make recommendations to resolve the dispute. If the tribe and the state do not reach an agreement, then the EPA resolves the matter and the federal determination becomes part of the air quality plan. Next, Ojibwe elder Rosemary Christensen has had her share of experiences with important events and people. As a founding member of the National Indian Education Association, she helped improve the educational opportunities for Native American students across Indian country. To, to where was it? Anyway, Rosemary Ackley Christensen was born on the Bad River Reservation in northern Wisconsin. As a young girl, she went to St. Mary's Boarding School due to her parents being diagnosed with tuberculosis. I was really lucky. There are lots of children, Indian children throughout the United States that went to boarding school and they had to go way far away from home. We were right smack in the village 
and that meant that I was able to interact with, with uh, elders, and there were Indian people that worked right smack at St. Mary's as well. I, grew, I was with my parents until I was about four or five, and obviously my father, well not obviously, my father was, was very into, into, what would I call it, Ojibwe way of looking at things spiritually, and he would have things in our, our little log cabin, I remember that, and he would have people come there for ceremony and so on. And so I had a problem, and I was just a little kid though, with some of the, what would I call it? We were, we were in a Catholic, that's a Catholic, St. Mary's is a Catholic school. And I remember arguing with the priest over some theology because I didn't, I thought it was, I didn't think it was logical. And as you know, with boarding schools, and how they were designed. When I taught federal Indian policy, I asked my students uh, what, they, they were just aghast at boarding school, and I asked them what, uh, what was the most ingenious thing that the white man did for, with the Indian, and they couldn't come up with anything. They thought it was all awful, and whether it's awful or not, boarding schools really worked, didn't they? When you think about what the, what the government wanted to do, you have to look at something from their point of view as well as yours. Now, from our point of view, it was awful. From their point of view, it was brilliant. They, we, we didn't get to speak our language. We, didn't, um, we, we, we were taken away from our families. We weren't raised with our families. When I was talking to my father and I was annoyed because I couldn't speak, I can't speak fluent Ojibwe, and he looked at me, he said, you did good in school though, didn't you, my girl? And that's, I was talking to Ada Deer about that, and she said that's basically what her dad said, too. Rosemary excelled academically, and at the time was one of the few Native Americans to graduate from college in Wisconsin. She attended graduate school at Harvard, and then earned her doctorate in education from the University of Minnesota. Now, see, this is one of those things where, where time and the people within the time if they coalesce, things happen, and I think that's what happened with our generation. At the particular time I went to school, I was 17 when I went to Stout. I was um, the only one for that semester in the state of Wisconsin uh, Indian. It was really an amazing thing how I was helped and how people like us were helped. And especially, of course, I couldn't have paid the tuition or anything like that. And that's true with graduate school, too. Her friends at Harvard, along with Senators Walter Mondale, Edward Kennedy, and Robert Kennedy, would collectively make a positive impact on the unique needs of American Indian and Alaska Native students. Mondale wanted, he was one of the people on the Indian subcommittee, he wanted somebody from Minnesota to, to be involved, and so I got to do, uh, got to help on the team that looked at the boarding schools for the Indian subcommittee. And ultimately, the Indian Education Act became law. Well, ultimately, uh, in 1970, the Indian Education Act of 1972, there was a period there where, where, the, where the Diné were, were putting together their college, and they would be in D.C., and, and the people, you know, there are varying people around the United States that were trying to do stuff, Indian people. And so Senator Ted Kennedy ended up chairing that, that subcommittee on Indian Education. After Bobby died, because Bobby was very, Senator Bobby, as we called him, uh, or Senator Robert, we didn't call him Bobby. Senator Robert was, was very interested in Indians. I don't know why, but he was. He, he went around to a couple different places. I remember once, where, where was it? He was, we were, he was looking at the library and, was, and we were pointing out, it was, the Indians were pointing out that there weren't nothing about Indians. But he was very interested. And then when he, uh, Senator, Senator Ted, I think, just sort of carried the torch for, for, for his brother. That's why he did that. What did the Indian Education Act do? Well, for the first time, and this, is a, this was a big thing for us that we wanted, was we wanted the parents to be involved. And that, that's what that law did. It required that parents be involved. We were very, very interested in the kinds of things that went on. And there were people, as I said, from all over the, all over the U.S. that, Indian people that were, that were interested, that were willing to work hard, that would come and go. and. How did the National Indian Education uh, Conference come about? I remember going to um, NCAI one year, and they had um, an hour or something like that on Indian Ed. I was really annoyed. 
So I got up on the stage and said, we're going to have our own conference next year. And I, what did I know? But I went back to Minnesota and talked to people, and, and um, they were interested. And they were incredible, incredible work, the, the Indian people in Minnesota. And we were able to put together, we didn't know what we were doing, but we were able to put together a conference. And we didn't know how many people we have, maybe, you know, 100, whatever. We had over 1,000, and they came from all over the country. That was in 1969 was the first conference. And then NIEA was founded the following year during the second conference. So the first and second national Indian education conferences were in Minnesota. Things had to change. And in order for them to change, you had to work with both the state legislature and the uh, United States. And I think about what the kinds of things that my father, father and my grandfather, the kinds of sacrifices they made and so on, and my mother and so on. People, uh, each generation learns, of course, as you know, from the next. And I think that, that um, one of the things that we, our generation still is working on is, is helping the next generation. When I first went into the service, you know, I thought we was just going to be a regular troops, you know, to fight. But they called us back and told us that we was going to use our native language, you know, to develop a code, and that's what we did. It took us almost about a year to, to develop this code, and when we went overseas, that's the only thing we used, you know, a Navajo language made into code, you know. And it's one of the roughest things for these Japanese tried to uh, decipher the code, you know, but they never did. And it's uh, one thing I always remember, you know, it's one of the most beautiful things that ever happened during World War II. I'm very proud and very happy about that. When we came home, you know, and uh, people, people asked us all kinds of questions, you know, but I think uh, they told us when we were discharged not to talk about what we did, you know, not to tell anybody, you know, or try to de decipher a code or something like that, you know. They wanted to know what we did, but they told us not to talk about what we did, you know. <clears throat> but uh, it took almost a little over 20 years before they told us it was all right to talk about it, you know, and, and that's when I told my folks and my <coughs> relatives, you know, what we did, and they were so happy to know that we used our native language to develop a code and use it during the war. <laughs> We continue now with part five of Inalik Little Diomede, a documentary by award-winning producer Jeannie Green. In tonight's segment, we learn about the efforts to teach the culture to the young people in the village. It's been said that the youth of rural Alaska are living in two worlds, one world being the traditional native lifestyle that they have grown accustomed to, and the other world being outside world, which is becoming ever more present in their daily lives. This balancing act for the kids has forced teachers to take an alternate approach to the educational process. Just this year, we started to implement what's called the quality school model, and what that is is we're, we're taking the Alaska standards, and then we, then the Barron Strait School District actually made them a little bit more precise, and then we're teaching to the standards rather than just letting a book direct what we do. We let, we do, we try to teach the standards, and once they master the standards at each level, then they progress to the next level. It's all more independent studies also. So a lot of it's project-based, which is excellent for the, for the students that we have because Rather than just doing book work, they got to be out doing real life skills. They've got to be, and that's part of the component is that they got to, we have to address every standard needs to be addressed 
in a way that they can use it in their real life. So it make education really practical and, and they start seeing why they need to be educated. To me, you can't totally show up and not teach them about themselves. And last year I was very, well, last year was my first year, I was very opposed to teaching anything about the outside. But then I realized, probably maybe after two months of doing it, that really, ultimately, you're doing them a disservice by not teaching about the outside. Because they, they need to know about that world, you know, almost as much as they need to know about this world. And they need to be able to balance both right. in order to be healthy adults or grow into healthy adults. For writing, for instance, you know, how do you, how do you go get, catch a bird, you know, and write down the steps for that. You know, you got to teach a kid how to organize a piece of writing, you know. So, you know, give me the breakdown of how you catch a bird. You know, and I learn a lot, too. You know, that's the other benefit of implementing, you know, culture into, uh, into the curriculum because then you learn. Right now you're only at negative 40. If they're good at participating in their culture, they even perceive themselves as good as participating in their culture, which most of them are. You know, you got third grade boys, they're starting to learn how to hunt. Um, you know, my second grader this year, Timmy, my one boy, he shot a seal this summer. I mean, I don't, you know, I don't know of anywhere where second graders are running around with guns. Um, you know, and shooting seals and providing food for their family. Um, third grade is typically the age when girls start cleaning meat out here, as far as I can tell. Um, you know, so they're good at those things and they perceive themselves as being good at those things. So if we can incorporate those things into the classroom, as, you know, any opportunity we get, if we do that, you know, the kid will feel successful, the kid will be successful. So overall, they're really good kids. They're really knowledgeable about the place that they live. And it shows. The youth of this village take pride in what they do. Here we see two young ladies practicing their carving techniques using soap. Carving is an age-old tradition of the Anupak people. You sit some cushions in there, that would be a nice couch. Next week, you can make a recliner. Diomede School has made sure that the youth of the village have activities to do in the evenings. Teachers donate much of their time to make sure that these kids keep busy learning both Western culture and their own. These young ladies are learning how to use a sewing machine on an island where there are no malls or clothing stores. Knowing how to make their own clothes will be beneficial for these youth. You pin it together. So Sam, this is what you're going to do when it comes to time for you to do it. Okay. Now sew along here. Straight down. Okay? Now what do you need? Good. Good. Lift up the back. Little further. Work more. Picking it with your feet. I have um, seven children. Um, I didn't grow. I grew. I didn't grow up learning my own Tanukiak language. And this is one thing I could teach my kids, and it's for better. And other kids. Andrea Sulik spends many of her evenings at the school teaching the youth many of the traditional songs and some not so traditional songs. They come from Diamond, some are from Russia, some are, um, I guess, what our elders made. You know, like stuff that came before, like we have a helicopter song. And, um, when the first helicopter came, I guess some, uh, one of our elders made it. Yeah, uh, yeah, uh, yeah, uh, yeah. Uh, yeah. Something I value a lot. Something I'm like I'm good at. It took me years to really become good. And they get to know the right way to dance. You know, like I was taught. The power of song and dance rings back through centuries. It's more than stories and movements. It's one way that these people express themselves and share with others, sharing who they are. When I was growing up, that was our entertainment. You know, it happened every Sunday. It's still around, but it's not as strong, and it's still really beautiful. Hey, 
For more information about Native Report or the stories we've covered, look for us at nativereport.org and Facebook. Thank you for spending this time with your friends and neighbors on Native Report. I'm Stacy Thunder. Hope to see you next time. Stacy Thunder is a member of and legal counsel for the Red Lake Nation, and Tad Johnson is a member of the Boys Fort Band of Chippewa and is chair for the American Indian Studies Department on the campus of the University of Minnesota Duluth. Production of Native Report is made possible by grants from the Shakopee Medwakanton Sioux Community, the Malax Band of Ojibwe, and the Blandin Foundation.